Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Welcome, everyone. Again, my name is Ashley Klein Menez, and you are joining us for our Prevent Connect Power and Prevention Ending Child Sexual Abuse web conference series. This session will be looking at building resilience in children to prevent child sexual abuse. Power and Prevention Ending Child Sexual Abuse web conference series is a national project of Prevent Connect and the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and information provided in this web conference does not necessarily represent the official views of CalCASA. So I am really excited to uh, present to you and introduce you to our series co-hosts and our facilitators for today, Cordelia Anderson and Joan Tabosnik. Cordelia and Joan, thank you so much for being back with us for another one of these really important conversations around ending child sexual abuse. How are you both doing today? We're great. And I'll, I'll uh, just say thank you uh, to Prevent Connect um, and all of you for joining us. Uh, we're really excited about today. I'm always excited to be able to do anything with my partner, Joan, uh, in this work, and this is a particularly important topic. So I think we go to Joan right away for the learning objectives, too. Great. So I'm going to give you the podium, Joan. Fantastic. Thank you. And it's really wonderful to be here as well. And, and be, being the nerd that I am, I had to count up, on the, and we've done 32 of them, at, um, of these sessions, I had, I, when you had them on the screen, Ashley. So um, um, so one just like, as every... We'd like to sort of say, you know, um, to begin each of these with uh, learning objectives. And um, the topic today is around resilience, and I'm so thrilled that this is the one that we're um, ending this year's series on. And um, I cannot think of any better topic. The learning objectives that we have are to identify the, um, the definition of resilience and, some, and offer you some timely research as well. Introduce the concept of post-traumatic growth um, and, 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 and tie that to resilience. And third, discuss how to increase resilience through the use of protective factors. So in terms of resilience, and what I love this quote about this quote is uh, Maya Angelou saying, I can be changed by what happens to me, but I refuse to be reduced by it. And I know that in terms i talking to a lot of people. Um, I'm wondering, Ashley, I'm hearing a lot of noise in the background. I'm wondering yeah. if you try to mute or remute before I go on. I'm I'm hearing that too. Amelda, would you go ahead and mute all lines once more, please? All guests have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. Hi, Ashley. It's Amelda. Hi, Hi this is James Jessie. Amelda. Yes. Okay, great. And can you hear me? This is Cordelia. Yep. Yep. Okay, great. And Pat, can you can we can you just jump in and make sure we can hear you as well? And Pat, you'll have to hit the star six one more time. And um, if you hit star six, then the, you'll hear a voice that says you're Okay, fine sorry. Repeated. I did it. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm here. We've got guys. you. Okay, we've got you. That's wonderful. So um, so let me just jump back in and terms of say that, um, that you know, resilience, I think, is such an important topic. And actually, at some level, I'm amazed that we haven't done this earlier in our series. I know for me that, you know, in doing this work, and, and um, I know Cordelia, you'll be talking about this as well, but just... I, it's so important that we think about how to talk about the difficult topic of child sexual abuse and child sexual abuse prevention with a sense of hope. And to me, resilience offers that hope. Um, by the APA definition, resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. And um, Cordelia, I don't know if you want to jump in with Dr. Michael Resnick's, um, I think, even even more apt. Sure, if we can go to the next slide there. i got to get, get myself into the podium or just have you go to the next slide. For me, just building on what Joan said, uh, in the early, in the mid-70s, when I started doing this work, I was also at, uh, happened to be at the University of Minnesota when the Youth Development Center was started. And Dr. Gisela, the late Dr. Gisela Kanaka, 
had really launched her research on young girls and the importance of focusing on strengths and the possibilities and what was happening that helped them thrive. And um, Michael Resnick and Bob Bloom were both uh, uh, professors at Adolescent Development. And Michael Resnick would give these great, eloquent, detailed definitions, academic, of resilience and go through studies like what Joan said, and then he put up a slide that said, really, it's the ability to bounce back despite the crap. And of course, we'll be hearing many more complexities and layers to that. But it was an early influence, as was Dr. Blum's point about we get far more back from building protective factors than we do from focusing in reducing risk factors. And what I found is that was always a challenge to stay in that strength base. How do we focus when Joan and Pat and I were all early on the coalition, National Coalition to Prevent Child Sexual Abuse, and we invited the late Peter Benson, who had led Search Institute, and they identified developmental assets. And for those of us doing this prevention work, when we'd hear the voices of Pat, who you'll be hearing more for, from, and Peter uh, talking about the importance of talking about protective factors and resilience, it was it was uh, very difficult difficult uh, for all the different agencies that did this work to keep any sense of balance with that. And Joan mentioned hope earlier. One, I do also work with missing um, uh, children and their families. And some of you have heard Patty Wetterling speak, whose son was missing for 27 years, and they found out last year that after he'd been abducted, he had been sexually abused and murdered. And at that time, one of the things uh, they did is they, and throughout the time he was missing, they talked about the power of hope. And at that time of facing all of what the outcome was for them at that point, they still focused on Jacob's 11 and that took off. And that was about be fair, be kind, be a good sport, uh, be a good friend. It was the characteristics that defined him it was traits, it was skills, those 11 pieces, but it was also what helped uh, that, that family to thrive and that incredible power of hope that uh, you'll be hearing much more about uh, with the resilience throughout this session. Back to you, Joan. So one of the things that um, I think probably everybody on the call is familiar with is with the um, ACEs study. And, um, you know, which is really talking about that, you know, we, that everybody has childhood experiences, both positive and negative, but those negative really has, for the first time when the ACEs study came out, this is the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, it really was a landmark study by, um, by Kaiser and Vincent Folletti and Robert Enda were the, the key um, researchers on that, and it was funded by the CDC. And basically demonstrated that, um, that positive and negative um, character, um, in, um, experiences have a tremendous impact on future um, violence victimization, perpetration, and more particularly lifelong health and opportunities. Um, and we talk about, mostly when we talk about ACEs, people talk about the, the uh, traumatic events in their lives. This is physical, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, um, neglect, also incarceration of a parent, witnessing abuse. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of research out there which has really been important in terms of documenting what the lifelong impacts of sexual abuse is. Um, what, as Cordelia said earlier, you know, that we talk about and we often focus on these risk factors, which I think was important, certainly in our field, to document really why it's so important to pay attention to child sexual abuse. Um, but um, what we haven't spoken as much about is really, um, is what are those protective factors and what, is the, what, what causes and what are some of the elements of resilience in a child? Um, and so we think it's equally important to talk about that and that's why we're focusing the, um, the entire session today on that topic. And I know that for me in doing this work, I often get asked like, you know, if my son or daughter has sexually abused, will they be damaged for life? Um, or even worse than given my work, will they really become an abuser? And I'm going to say that neither of those is true. Um, and usually my response in terms of a quick response is saying that, you know, that it's true that their life may be changed forever, um, but they absolutely can learn to live a safe and healthy life. And partly what I'm excited about today is that Pat is going to be talking a little bit about that. Back to you, Cordelia. So another chunk of the work we do, because it's prevention, of course, is dealing with secondary trauma, compassion, fatigue, and professional wellness. How do we keep ourselves as individuals? How do we keep our organizations that, that deal with so much trauma healthy so that we can keep doing this work and we can operate ourselves from a point of strength? 
And what's exciting to me is to see the resilience materials coming out in that field as well. Um, so one source, there are many now, but uh, that some of you might be interested in is, uh, is the underlying competency for resilience in this sense of it from the Chadwick Trauma Informed Systems Dissemination and Implementation Project. So there's a link there for you. But the best part is getting to introduce Pat Stanton Lasky, who I've known for a very long time. And this picture, Pat, awesome podium, captures her spirit. So I'm going to tell a little bit more about who she is for those of you that don't know. Uh, she has her own consulting firm, Partnering in Prevention. But before that, she was Administrator of the Office of Early Childhood Services at New Jersey's Department of Children and Families, where she managed prevention programming for the most vulnerable children zero to six years old. For a lot of her career and where I first met her, she was Executive Director of the New Jersey Child Assault Prevention CAP Project and Executive Director of their National and International Assault Prevention Project. She's conducted trainings all over this country, but also in 16 countries outside of the U.S. So along with being a frequent presenter, she's also the recipient of a lot of different awards, including the Commissioner's Award from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She's a longtime member of the International Society for Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect and has served on their expert uh, facility faculty as well as being an early member of the National Coalition to Prevent Child Sexual Abuse and Exploitation. And for today's topic, there was no one better we could think of and no one we could think of to uh, bring that perspective and that link to this valuable, important information. However, for Pat, I just want to acknowledge that not only is she bringing this here to you today, but as someone who most often does day-long or week-long trainings on this, uh, it was, it's a challenge that she completely rose to to try to think about how to bring that to you in a concise way with key links to other material. Mostly I want you to know that Pat is the embodiment, I think, of resilience with a strength of spirit, humility, grace, and humor that uh, helps everybody around her. So we're very proud to have her be here today. So now, Pat, the podium goes to you. Okay, so now I have to figure out how to do this, right, kids? So I think it's yep. good. So, uh, <laughs> so um, wow, what a great introduction. I, I want to meet me. I sound very exciting. Um, it's not at all what I think of myself. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, or uh, my friends in Guam, good evening, I guess. Uh, a, a special thanks to, um, really, to, to Ashley and David at Prevent Connect and to my dear friends here, uh, Cordelia and Joan. I, I am really thrilled to do this and also, as Cordelia said, a bit challenged. Um, um, this is such a huge topic and I do do an awful lot of work on it. Um, I'm so grateful, really, um, for the chance to share anything, even if it's only 30 minutes, um, about this fascinating subject because it's, it's near and dear to my heart. So um, let's get started, right? Um, uh, <laughs> People uh, use this term resilience so much, so I always start my PowerPoint off with this because a lot of people think resilience is just about bouncing back. So therefore, we have you know shampoo that helps you bounce back. We have Estee Lauder face cream. Lord knows what that helps you bounce back from. And of course, pantyhose. Uh, and again, who knows what that helps you bounce back from. But bounce back seems to be the, the term people use most often. But here's the term that most of us who, who really have looked into resilience for many years um, uh, really define resilience as. And if you look closely, um, it's a lot more than just bouncing back. Uh, so I think for the purpose of this kind of quick workshop, I'm going to ask all of you out there to use this as the definition. The human capacity to face, to overcome, and be strengthened or transformed by the adversities of life. And of course, the key words that I highlighted that I think we all need to remember, no matter what field we're working in, is people can be strengthened by and transformed by the difficult things that happen to us. And you know, you've heard this expression many times, I think. You know, I, I wouldn't be the person I am today if it weren't what happened to me uh, at a certain point in my life. And so that's what we mean um, when we really talk about resilience. So um, let's talk a little bit about what it is. And I want to do that today if I can. I want to do some definitions for you. I want to do some genetic connections. 
Uh, and then we want to talk about something called post-traumatic um, growth. So let's keep going and talk a little bit about what resilience is. Um, we know that it is continually changing. Uh, sometimes we're resilient, sometimes not so much. Um, we know from the time that we're little until we draw our last breath that we are building our resilience, right? Um, so let's keep going here. Um, it, and here's the critical thing about resilience that I think everybody needs to know because it's really an important fact, and that is it's not a trait. Resilience, it's, it's so much more than that. It's actually a skill. So, so what does that mean to us as, as clinicians, as therapists, as educators, as parents? What it means is that resilience can be taught. Just, just how we teach children to tie their shoes, we can teach skills that build resilience. And I want to just take a, a very quick second to talk a little bit because I think you always have to honor uh, the pioneers who do the work before you, and there are certainly many of them. Uh, Dr. Norman Garmacy is one of the first people who ever started doing research around resilience. And Dr. Garmacy actually started because he was working with women who had been diagnosed with schizophrenia, mothers. And he was absolutely amazed at how, quote, normal, unquote, these children were. It just fascinated him because they were in such challenging positions. And so he began looking into resilience really as the result of that. And then the person that all of us probably could Google and see, she does an amazing TED Talk, is Dr. Ann Mastin, who joined him about 10 years later back in the, back in the 70s. And uh, she is continuing to do work. So if any of you are interested in her and really want to find out more in depth, um, Dr. Mastin is really a wonderful resource. But here's a, here's a quote that she, that she uses frequently, and, I, and it's one of my favorites. What began as a quest to understand the extraordinary has actually revealed the power of the ordinary. So um, I just want to share with you, um, I, was, I was doing a workshop not long ago, and I don't know if I can say this on the call, but I'm going to say it because it's important. Um, I uh, <laughs> was doing this workshop, and I was using Dr. Mastin's quote about how ordinary resilience really is, and I met um, what I would like to call a moron. Um, and I'll let all of you on the call decide, um, see if you agree with me. So, so I'm doing this workshop, and I do Dr. Mastin's quote, and this man stands up and he says, well, if resilience is so commonplace, then maybe child abuse isn't so bad after all. So I should ask you all to raise your hands if you agree, but that would probably be it. many, many of you. Uh, so, you know, as professionals, we always have to protect ourselves from these kinds of attitudes, right? So now on all my slides, every time I do a PowerPoint, I stick this little slide in there. Uh, and as, as you talk about resilience, I hope you're careful um, how you explain it in case anyone should make the same assumption as this as this particular person did. And resilience, yes, it is prevalent, but it is in no way a reason why children should be maltreated. Um, so let's keep going. Um, the question remains why. Why are some people so resilient and others just cannot seem to overcome whatever experience they have? And so one of the really exciting things, and I get a little bit excited about this because um, it's just a pretty amazing discovery, is we're beginning to connect um, genetics and the environment to resilience. And this is no different than we've always done when you think about it. We've always had the nature versus nurture um, topic, right? Um, what, what is genetic, what we're born with, and what influences us. But here is something really exciting. And I have to say that I, I missed when I did this picture of the microscope they kind of cut off the eye on Dr. Caspi's name. So his name is really Absalom Caspi. So he and his wife, Terry Moffitt, back in 2003, which seems like a long time ago, but actually in research isn't that long ago, um, they discovered an actual uh, resilience gene. And I want to just talk to you a little bit about it because I get so excited when I talk about this. So. They discovered this gene called the 5-HTP gene, 
and it basically has one function, and that is to carry serotonin uh, to the brain, right? And serotonin has a lot of different terms. I put this, it's a neurotransmitter, and I put this in here because it's kind of a funny term. Um, some people call it the happy neurotransmitter because it regulates our moods, and it also is the chemical that helps um, soothe us or helps calm us down in emergencies. The, the body produces this chemical and it goes right to the brain and the brain says, you know, chill out, it's okay. So serotonin is a critical uh, chemical that we produce in our bodies. So they discovered this gene that carries this valuable serotonin to the brain so our, our emotions can be regulated. So this gene is divided into two parts. And it's really important that you listen to this and understand it because the exciting part is yet to come, right? So it's divided into two parts. So every one of us in the world, all of us on this call, everybody has this gene, and it's made up of two parts. And scientists call them LLs, but I'm not a scientist, so I call them parts. So these two parts, one is either a long part or a short part, or else you might have two longs or two shorts. So we all have this gene. Some of us have two long versions. Some of us have two short. Some of us have one of each. So your question undoubtedly is, how are they different? They're really different because the longer version is twice as efficient as the shorter one in transporting that really valuable serotonin to the brain. Uh, so which one would you rather have? We could do a poll here, Ashley, right? Uh, so which one would you rather have? Well, research has shown us that people with at least one short are less resistant to depression than people who have two longs because longer versions seem to give the carriers a, a better chance of bouncing back when they're, when they're uh, facing negative situations. So, but here's another fascinating discovery. You ready? In the absence of stress or trauma, which I hope is all of us on this phone call today, that gene just lies dormant. It never kicks in. That's why it's a resilience gene rather than a depression-prone uh, gene. So, and just so you can get an idea, this, this uh, research was so um, well-received that uh, since its discovery, uh, several Comprehensive and very long-term studies have um, have been done that support these findings, and you can see here that uh, the findings. This is in Time Magazine, by the way. In case you're wondering and looking for that Time Magazine cover, you won't find it because they magically superimposed the 5-HTD gene on top of the Time Magazine cover, which I probably can be sued for doing, but we'll hope that won't happen. So you can see that this says that folks who have the shorter version. Uh, seem to be especially prone to difficulty when they face traumatic events. Um, so fascinating, fascinating discovery. Um, another validation, this one from VCU, um, interesting study done with 500 sets of twins, and they found that even mild stressors combined with the short version of this gene uh, resulted in higher incidence of depression. So let's keep moving because it's pretty neat. Um, I want to just explain, if I can, if you have an opportunity to listen to Dr. Stephen Suomi, um, he is from the National Institute of Health. He uh, did amazing, amazing experiments with um, Reese's monkeys and um, basically did hundreds of experiments testing the 5-HTT gene. And, and Reese's monkeys, by the way, have 96% of our DNA. So this was a wonderful group for him to, um, to, to try this with. And he found a couple of things. And one of the things he found was and just, I, I'm sorry, I get so excited about this. But <laughs> one of the things he found about these monkeys was when he tested them, the environmental bond of mother and child um, outperformed the genetic makeup of the monkeys that had short versions of this gene. So he did several tests with long version monkeys, short version monkeys, and he found that the environment seemed to overcome the genetic makeup 
of these monkeys, which is just amazing. So then Dr. Joan Kaufman, and I don't know how many of you know Dr. Kaufman, but she is just an amazing woman. She, back in the early 80s, along with Ed Ziegler, who started who started Head Start, actually, out of Yale University, she was one of the first people I ever read research on who talked about what happens to adults who are abused as children. What, what happens to them? What, are they, what becomes of them? Uh, do they break the cycle? Are they abusive parents, consequently, uh, as a result of their experiences? And I loved reading her stuff because she was the first one, first one I ever read about who said 66% of adults abused as children do not grow up to be abusive parents. Indeed, not only are they oftentimes good parents, they're oftentimes exemplary parents. And, you know, for all of us who work in this field, oh, that is such valuable information for us to tell families, to tell victims, to tell people, to tell survivors, um, that, that only 33% end up doing in that cycle that we've read about and studied about all through college and through our, through our uh, clinical work. So Joan Kaufman has been doing work for a very, very long time. So I love that I read she is now researching the 5-HTTG. And um, again, you have to look. I don't have time to do her, uh, her study, which is, I'd love to. Uh, when I do an all-day workshop on resilience, I go into her study in quite depth because it's, it's quite fascinating. Um, but her basic discovery was, when, when, and I'll just kind of read you a synopsis, when put in, in a stressful situation, children who um, had short versions of the 5-HTT gene still did amazingly well um, despite uh, uh, environmental challenges if they had someone in the environment someone who is significant to them, someone who they, whom they see daily, somebody, someone who believes in them and who supports them. Uh, and that says a lot to us about how the environment affects resilience. So let's keep moving because I, I could spend the whole time on this gene and I can't do that. So let's talk about what version you have. Everybody on the call, I'm sure you're wondering what version you have. Um, so 17% of the human population has two shorts. 51% has one of each, and 31% have two longs. 33% uh, of the white population has two longs, and African Americans are more likely to have at least one long. Um, so this is, this is a whole piece on genetics, and sometimes when I do this and I'm doing it with clinicians or, or therapists or something, somebody says, Oh my gosh, no wonder I can't do anything with that kid. He's got two shorts. Um, and I just want to say to you, this is where genetics is great. You know, it's important and this is an amazing discovery. But what's really important is the environment. And that leads me, leads me to kind of the protective factors that we look at when we study resilience. And um, there are really three ways we can promote resilience in children and in adults um, as well. Um, and I would be willing to bet that uh, you see here, the first thing is caring relationships, right? So I would be willing to bet that every person on this call who's helping others, who's, who's teaching others, who's mentoring other people, had someone in his or her life who cared, um, who taught you to care, and who believed in you, who supported you, who built your resilience. And it's so important for us as we work with with people out there in the world, um, and especially people who have been victims, to be that caring person. And it may sound corny, and but it is the single greatest um, uh, reason why people can be resilient, because they have that one person. And when I teach my child welfare workers, I say to them all the time, you may be that one person that this child who's now 12 at 36, we'll say this was the person that made a difference. So caring relationships are a huge protective factor for building, for building resilience. And, you know, it means that we offer sometimes, you know, I asked kids once, how do you define a caring person? And a couple of things they said really struck me. One was simple, sustained kindness. 
And I just love that description. Um, trust, respect, unconditional love. So caring relationships is one way. A second way that may surprise some people is high expectations. You know, when we tell someone that they can accomplish something and, and we support them, obviously, in doing that in as many ways as we can, then they begin to believe that they can do it. They begin to have hope. And when goals uh, and hope are together, people can do amazing things. And I just want to share with you that I always show this picture of Jim Abbott, first of all, because I'm a huge Yankee fan. Sorry to all of you who are not. Um, my son married a Red Sox fan, and I'm still in therapy over it. Uh, but I show this picture of Jim Abbott because if you look closely, Jim is missing uh, his right hand. He has little nubs on his right hand. So when he was uh, when he was a young boy, about eight years old, he decided he wanted to play Little League, and his parents said, okay, fine, and they took him down to play to try out. And the coach kind of took them aside and said, I don't know, I think maybe soccer would be better. And the parents looked at the coach and said, well, why? What's the problem? And the coach looked at them kind of incredulous. And he goes, well, he's missing a hand. And I swear if you read Jim's autobiography, you'll hear his parents' response was, shh, don't tell him. Mm-hmm. So that is what we mean about high expectations. Jim ended up uh, being his high school quarterback. He went to the University of Michigan. He had his number retired. He won the Golden Spikes Award, which goes to one college athlete every year. Um, I watched him pitch in the uh, in the Olympics uh, in 1980, and I also watched him pitch in 1993, a no-hitter against Cleveland. So there you go, high expectations, right? So the third thing that builds resilience in addition to Um, caring relationships and high expectations is to help people see that they have a purpose in this world, that they matter. Um, I think often of the childhood that I had. um, It was filled with abuse, all kinds of abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, domestic violence to the point of almost being lethal. And I felt so many times insignificant. Um, I felt unimportant to anybody. And then I remember the day that a teacher told me that I mattered, that there was a place waiting for me outside of my abuse, that there there was a place where I could do great things, where I could be happy. And that was all that I needed. Um, And I'm not guaranteeing that I'm doing great things with my life, but boy, what a difference it made to make me feel like I had a purpose. So are we doing that with children? Are we doing that with the adults we work with? Because it makes a huge difference. So um, those are three ways to build resilience. Uh, They can be coupled with all kinds of other tools and approaches. Um, And um, I want to just share with you one other thing that I think is a great resource for you, and that is Dr. Grotberg's uh, work with the International Resilience Project. Um, she took people from countries that are at war, experts uh, in, in social work in the field of uh, community, uh, and she took them because the children in those communities from places like Northern Ireland and the Balkans and Eastern Africa, uh, where these experts uh, talked about their children and how, they, how these children managed to survive in war, um, And I want you to look at each of the things that they came up with. Um, They decided that kids needed three things in order to become resilient, even in these conditions. And the first thing they needed was external support. What does that mean? Um, That means that they needed people around them. They, They needed friends. They needed people who believed in them and people who were there. Uh, for them when they when they needed them. And so they took this external support and they kind of turned it into um, starting a sentence off with the word I have and asking children to complete that sentence. So tell me who your external supports are. And children would say things like I have, and you see, I've, I've just written a few of them here. My gosh, there's a bazillion of them that we've gotten from children. Um, 
and also from adults. Um, I've actually done this with the people at DCF when I worked in New Jersey in the Department of Children and Families, and we talked about as a kind of a morale builder, uh, what kind of external supports uh, do you have in your job? And people would list, well, I have a great supervisor, I have a great team that works with me. So just so you folks listening understand, this isn't just about children. Uh, this is about building resilience in, um, in all of us uh, as adults as well. So complete the sentence and try this with some of the folks that you work with. I have blank and have them fill in what their external supports are. So that's something they need. The second thing they need is some kind of personal strength. Um, and that means philosophies, um, beliefs, attitudes. You know, what kind of person are you? Um, what do you believe in? And then they complete that sentence with the word I am. So we had I have, now we have I am. And these are places, and again, here's just a couple of really hot, quick examples. I'm a competent person. I'm able to see positives. Um, I'm responsible for the things I do. I'm honest. I'm hardworking. Um, you know, so this is the second thing. And the third thing is an interesting one, and that is uh, some kind of social and interpersonal skills. So, you know, I can do what? What can you do? What skills do you have? Um, and so this is really all about asset building. Again, having either children or adults complete, I can talk to somebody if I have a problem. I can figure things out. I can ask for help. Um, and so this is, I, I find this to be one of the best tools I've ever used as far as resilience goes because it's all about asset building. And, you know, I, I know that uh, Cordelia mentioned the Search Institute earlier, and if you haven't Googled it, you really need to look at the Search Institute because <laughs> I've been using that probably for the past 30 years. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful tool, just as this one is. Um, and you know why? Because sometimes when you work with people, and especially if you work with, with victims, uh, I'm doing a lot of work now with uh, victim advocates, in the court system here in New Jersey. And a lot of them don't think they have very many assets. They're kind of beaten down and they're feeling as though they're vulnerable. Um, and you sit with them, or even with teenagers, I've done this with teenagers too, you sit with them and they think, well, I have maybe 14 assets. But when you finish looking at the Search Institute's 40 assets, um, you, they realize they actually have about 31. Um, and so this is a wonderful, wonderful tool. Okay, we're going to keep moving because else I'm going to run out of time and I'll be very upset. So let me introduce you to um, Dr. Tedeschi and Dr. Calhoun. Um, and the reason I have growing, adjusting, and adapting up there um, is um, we, uh, you know, one of the terms that's being used quite frequently around now uh, around brain development is neuroplasticity. And it means that the brain has the ability to, to evolve during our lifetimes, right? To grow, to adjust, to adapt, as we all face a, a plethora of experiences. And this adapting and adjusting actually may be at the heart of resilience. And Dr. Tedeschi and Dr. Calhoun um, have done some work that I think will really interest many of you. Um, they are doing work around what they call post-traumatic growth. Um, and let me just explain what it is first and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Post-traumatic growth, according to them, is, you know, although an experience may be traumatic, the word I want you to underline here is the aftermath of it, is when people find that they've learned something valuable, they've changed the way they look at their life, their values have changed, or actually for many people, they have a personal transformation. And that part, um, they have done about 30 years of research on bereavement and loss. That's a lot, 30 years of research. Um, and so here are their findings, which I just think are fascinating. Um, we finally have research documenting what we always thought to be true, what I said earlier that, you know, 
experiences we have in life really make us sometimes who we are. So look at this, 50 to 75% of the people they worked with over this 30-year period around uh, trauma, bereavement, and loss have reported a positive change as a result of that experience. But here's the very, very important piece. It's not the trauma that made them grow, but it's the way the trauma was handled that really made the difference. And um, I think that um, I think that this is something where we, you know, we kind of have known it all along, but now it's a whole new piece. So what they did was they found out that there were five domains in which people have grown, right? And I want to share each of those domains with you uh, just very quickly if I can. The first one is personal strength. So how did people grow and become more resilient and in the personal strength area, well, they're saying things like, I never knew I could do this. I never knew I was so strong. Um, and one of the quotes that I've read in the course of looking up their, their research is, when something bad happens, you have three choices. You can either let it define you, let it destroy you, or let it strengthen you. And that's obviously what this piece means. So in one the first domain is personal strength. The second domain where people have grown and had post-traumatic growth is an appreciation of life, um, appreciating the little things uh, that kind of go to make up the bigger picture, uh, noticing things that we might have missed that we didn't, never saw before. Um, and you can see this quote, learning to appreciate what you have before time makes you appreciate what you had. Um, and the third domain that people have grown um, is in uh, different, different relationships with other people. You know, sometimes before bad experiences, we're not used to, to asking for help. We're not used to sharing personal feelings, maybe to admitting our problems, um, to being open to other people. But once we almost have to do these things when something happens, it becomes easier. Um, it becomes more satisfying, and I think we also discover it becomes more helpful. Uh, we meet new people, and we learn new ways to communicate that we perhaps hadn't used before. The uh, fourth domain that they see post-traumatic growth in is in new possibilities. Um, sometimes the worst possible events in our lives allow new and unexpected uh, possibilities to open up so that we end up having new goals, we have new connections, we have new ideas. And the reason that little I uh, thing from that is there is because if you know the name Carolyn Leitner, you'll know that Carolyn lost her 13-year-old daughter to a hit-and-run driver um, who was drunk. And as a result of that tragedy, um, she ended up starting Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Again, new possibilities. So the fifth domain in which people have grown um, is an interesting one, and that is the spiritual change. Um, you know, it it's a uh, it may mean that it is a spiritual change in the truest sense that perhaps people end up uh, going to church more, maybe an organized religion or maybe a stronger belief in a higher power. Or it may just be that we ask ourselves about what our purpose is on this planet, you know? Um, why are we here? What is, what is life all about? Um, so people need to know that there is hope uh, and, and also transformation um, as a result of difficult and challenging situations. So um, as we're kind of working, working on focusing on these five strength-based areas, areas, which Cordelia talked about, and I think strength-based is so critical, um, I want to just share another quick thing with you if I can. Um, boy, this is so hard to do in a really short time. Um, um, I'm this is fine. Keep going. Keep going. You're you're fine. Well, um, thank you because I'm I'm really feeling like I'm talking so fast and um, so so I want to share with you uh, something called uh, kintsugi, which is a Japanese technique uh, that uh, the Japanese people use for repairing broken pottery, and they repair it with uh, seams of of gold. Um, and however, however we grow, I think the fact that many of us have been broken uh, 
shouldn't mean that we're less valued. Um, and I know Joan said that at the beginning, we're, we're less loved or less capable uh, of surviving and, and thriving. I was given uh, this wonderful gift from a friend recently, um, and it it was a ceramic bowl, and it had these streaks of gold running through it, and it seemed kind of strange to me that she would give me a gift that had clearly been broken and then repaired. Um, and so it seemed strange, really, strange, really, until I um, read this piece of paper that is inside the bowl, um, and you can see. Um, I, and I maybe I don't know if everybody can really read it if it's small print, but let me just read it anyway. When you, we view our lives as broken or even shattered, we begin to understand that no matter the trauma, despair, hurt, feel, fear, abuse, failure, addiction, disease, and even death, our scars are just part of us. Each time we fix ourselves, each time we fix ourselves, the new beginning makes us stronger. Our life bonds are reinforced through mending. Those breaks are a place for beauty to transpire. And we are more beautiful for being broken. And then along with that, I will share with you one of my favorite quotes from uh, Ernest Hemingway's wonderful book called The Farewell to Arms about an Italian ambulance driver during World War II. The world breaks everyone. And afterwards, some are broken. Or some are strong at the broken places. And I just want to share before I go to my almost last slide that I um, I do this work so often and I have people come up to me all the time and say, I kind of didn't think resilience was this easy. Um, and um, it always kind of, <laughs> it kind of encourages me because I think it says, um, yeah, I can I can do this. I thought this was a, first of all, I thought it was a trait, and you either had it or you didn't. Um, and now people are seeing that it is something that we need to work on every single day. Um, people themselves need to work on it, and those of us who work with them uh, need to work on it because um, we need to kind of establish, if we can, a, a sort of a balance, and that's my, my yin and my yang. Um, the end is the love and the care and the support and remember, guys, of just one person sometimes um, in our lives that is that becomes the resilience factor for people. Uh, and of course, the yang represents all of the difficulties, all of the challenges and the adversities we experience in life. Um, and it's the interaction of those two that helps prevent abuse and kind of keeps us emotionally balanced. And I want to say that whether I've worked for a long, long time, as Cordelia and Joan both know, in the field of child sexual abuse prevention, um, and um, I, I, when I was doing this, I thought, how can I make this be so specific to child sexual abuse? And I tried and tried for a while, and then finally I said to myself, that's crazy. Um, it, this fits everywhere. This fits everything, every person, every field. Um, Resilience is a fascinating field and just now beginning to open up uh, a lot of new research being done. Um, and so, and let me just share my last slide, which for you guys would be um, hopefully things that you can look up. And also the handouts, I think that I, handout I gave, I think is about um, doing strength-based work and a, a variety of questions that people can um, People that they work with. Um, I just, I don't know if I should just say something about that handout. Could I do that just very quickly? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so I, I have a handout for all of you from, uh, from Dennis Celebi, who is from the University of Kansas. And I give this out a lot of times when I work with my child welfare folks, um, child welfare workers, um, because it asks five different types of questions. The first one, um, is about survival. For example, um, uh, how have you been able to rise to the challenges put before you? Uh, all kinds of questions about survival. Another one is support questions, which will always be a key piece. Um, you know, who do you have in your life? Um, who can you depend on? Another one is called exception questions, which may surprise people. Um, these are for parents going through a difficult time, you know. Um, 
when things were going well in your life, what was different? Um, different questions like that. Then there's our hopeful questions, which he calls possibility questions. Um, what are your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations? How far along are you toward getting there? Um, and then esteem questions. Um, you know, when people say good things about you, what are they likely to say? I love that question. Um, I asked that to a group I had yesterday, and it was hilarious, actually, <laughs> the, the thing. But it was also very, very touching and very moving. Um, so I gave you that as a handout. Um, again, Joan and Cordelia, I honestly could, could do this all day long, and I feel so um, kind of sad that I cut it so short. But at least it gives folks a little bit of a kind of a – a thumbnail look at, at how resilience started, a little bit of that exciting genetic connection, and also I think not to forget the post-traumatic growth piece because that is just so important to us. It's that hope word, right, Cordelia? Mm-hmm. Well, so I so I have gone through everything, and, and I don't know if I went too long. No, no. It doesn't matter. We are perfect. Yes. It's perfect. So... so um. We have a question actually coming up for, for the audience to answer, and I just want to also just say, you know, um, this is just, I, mean, I know that we push you to do everything like a whole day training, and, and where you could do a two day training into just a half hour. So thank you, Pat, that was a really fantastic overview. Um, and we also have a chance to, um, you know, to do some Q&A, so I just want to remind people from the audience that, you know, if you want to type, if you have any questions, but we want to start off actually with a question for the audience here about, um, how do you, um, or how can you integrate resiliency information um, into your work? And um, it's maybe while they're typing in their responses, Pat, maybe you can talk a little about how you have been able to do that, because you really are one of the few people I know who has, really since I met you, always have an element of resiliency in the, your, your talks, and you know, that comes through certainly in the humor and, um, you know, and, and just the hopefulness. So I'm just wondering if you can maybe talk about you know, when someone asks you to speak about trauma, how do you you integrate the resiliency piece as you're as you're talking about sort of devastation or the aces and things like that? Well, I, you know, I think it's more a case of how do I integrate trauma and other things into my resilience because mm. I just constantly, um, I think when I speak to a group of people, I want them to leave feeling hopeful, and that's one of the the big issues I had at the beginning with ACEs because it felt uh, I felt it left people in such a such a difficult place, uh, a very difficult place for those of us who have had histories that are really, you know, dark and scary and difficult. Um, and so I I am so happy that resilience is being added to that piece now because it's just critical. I I. I I honestly don't know any way to answer that, Joan, except to say I don't ever do any presentation ever without mentioning, first of all, what I said to you folks today, about 66% of us grow up to be wonderful parents. Um, you know, I think we have to kind of get rid of some of the myths um, around things like that. You know, when I remember, and this is going to sound really corny, but I remember holding our first child and, and the other two kids as well in the middle of the night, you know, when you're you're the only one up except for you and the dog and the baby and you're talking to the baby and hoping probably they don't remember half of what you say, but I remember holding that little guy and looking at him and saying, you know, you may never be rich and you may never have everything you want, but you will always be loved and you will always be safe uh, because I wasn't, I wasn't. And I think for many of us, we end up being great parents. And, I, and so every, every presentation I do, every time I speak to a reporter, every time I have any chance to talk to anybody that besides <coughs> myself, um, I always add that piece about the fact that we are resilient, that we do, we do heal and we do grow and we do become, you know, sometimes amazing people. And I think people need to hear that. So I'm I'm a huge resilience person. I don't know if that answered the question, but um, it answers it. Yes, that was fantastic. And I, 
Um, and, and, I, and I just love the way you turn the question around as well in terms of not how do you integrate resiliency into trauma, but how do you do the, you know make sure that what you, your, your, your centerfold and the, the, in the holding that you do is always about resiliency uh, first and foremost. And I, I, I love that. Um, people are talking about in their therapy work and in their advocacy, um, helping people to see their strengths, um, building it into all the prevention training, um, building it into classroom settings, spreading the awareness in communities, helping uh, survivors to see uh, their strengths and their possibilities and integrating all of this throughout their work, building on the social-emotional learning work that they're getting and strengthening it there, and, um, and looking at the reality of the intersections between multiple types of violence and oppression and how to really build on that. And the last comment was related to building on the resiliency of hope, and they're flooding in. I want to ask um, the audience a key question, and, and that is, if you could just real quickly words, how did listening to Pat talk about this make you feel? How are you feeling from this session? And while people are typing, um, you know, we're getting, they're coming fast, uh, so hopeful was the first one, and um, motivated uh, and wanting more. Uh, people are going to want your longer training, feeling supported, feeling uplifted, feeling inspired, um, making it sound easy and doable and encouraged and enlightened and enthusiastic and amped up to keep advocating. Uh, and that's the power of Pat. It's the power of certainly who you are and how you present this and what you've done in your own life and work. It's the power of this message and it's the power of the gift that um, this session is, and you give us by helping us remember, get grounded, learn about this because it is central to the work that we do. Well, and it's also, I would answer that every one of those answers that people gave, inspired, hopeful, encouraged, are how I feel looking at their answers. Uh, because I'm old, let's face it, right? <laughs> and I'm and I'm tired, and I've been doing this work a long time, as we, as you both have, and as other folks on this line have, I'm sure. But how wonderful is it to see? I'm sure some of these people are young enough to be my grandchildren, right, or my children. So how wonderful, wonderful is it for us uh, who have been doing this work so long to see these responses? Because you know, it says that it's okay that that people are going to be doing this work and helping other people around the world for a very long time. And that's, that's, an, amazing, that's an amazing feeling. So thank you to all of you. I also am kind of amazed, like, as I look, look, I'm just looking at the chat, you know, that um, I don't think I've ever been or looked at a chat around child sexual abuse and heard all those kinds of adic you know, adjectives. You know, um, and you know to see you know um, I mean usually we're trying to sort of pull hope out of despair and to sort of have a whole list of attitudes that's really about motivation and excitement and um, you know, that that all is you know uplifting motivated encouraged all those things are just words that I don't often see related here um, I also just find it interesting just as a comment of just how usually there's like a flurry of questions and we don't we're not flooded with questions. So um, I just think that's, I, and I, it reminds me a little bit of sort of like, think, always think of like, you know, in, you know, if you think about it in therapy, it's so much harder to talk about trauma, much easier to talk about trauma in some ways than it is to talk about joy. And, you know, and I think partly what you're asking us to do is to make sure that we marry, you know, that life, is, life has both aspects of that. And you're asking us to tie those two together um, so that when we do address trauma, we, um, we are looking at Joy, and even when we're looking at joy, we're seeing like where some of the strengths from that come from. And I just think that's really a, an amazing challenge, Pat, that you are giving to us on the call as well as to us in the field. You know, and and I'm just sort of wondering, Pat, given that you know, given that you do have you know years of of experience in this work, and I'm wondering if you have sort of you know have ways of, especially when you know, faced with the immediacy of trauma, how do you start weaving in? The resiliency right from day one, and you know, and and, and you know, especially when people are, are you know in the midst of the trauma and the midst of the pain, that um, 
you know, some of those questions that you asked earlier um, you know, aren't, aren't, aren't going to be easy questions for people to grapple with. And I'm just wondering, how do you, how do you move, how do you get people to move or start contextualizing it that way? Well, I mean, I honestly, I'm, I'm not an expert at this, you know that. Um, I'm just a person. And I, you know, I, I think one of the things that I've always thought was important was to, to, to remind people of all the assets. And I really, that's why I love the Search Institute so much and I love the I Have, I Am, I Can, um, because so oftentimes people, people forget. Um, people are so, you know, it kind of reminds me, I do one exercise when I, when I teach this, a Quaker exercise, and I just have to share it with you because it's so easy. You go to Staples and you get some of those dots that you put on, you know, just regular little circle, circular dots. Um, I don't know what you put them on, but anyway, they're blue, they're black, they're green. Um, and I have people take one of those dots. They're only about an inch in diameter. And they put it in the center of their palm, right? And I love the Quakers because they're so simple and they're so powerful. So you take this dot and you identify it as a real serious problem that is bothering them. It's just driving them crazy, right? So I tell them to take their hand and hold it horizontally, okay? And you all can do this with me while we're doing it. Not vertically. It won't work if it's vertical. It's got to be horizontal. And bring that dot right up until your nose is just touching it, okay? And then I ask them a couple of questions. Leave it there. Don't move it. And I ask them, can you see anything else except the dot? And they say, no. Uh, what, tell me about the dot. And some people say, well, it's doubled. It looks like there's two dots there. And then I say, can you, uh, do you feel kind of overwhelmed? And they're like, yes. And ask them a couple of questions like that. And then I say, okay, guys, just pull your hand back very slowly. And now look at that dot, that problem. Is it clearer? Yes. Can you see other things besides the dot? Yes. Does it feel as overwhelming? No. And so the message here is that, and I think it's an answer somewhat to your question, Joan, is sometimes we're so overwhelmed by a problem that it, we can see nothing else. We can't see any options. We can't see anything else we can do. Uh, it's overwhelming. But then when we step back from it, and we look at all the people who are around us that can help us, all the options that we have, all the possibilities, the problem doesn't seem as big, and certainly it isn't doubled. Um, and I love this so much that I've actually used this with my kids so much that when they see me coming, they go, no, Mom, not the dot, please, not the dot. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great message, and it's kind of what you're asking, because I think in the beginning when people are traumatized, when there's problems, they are so overwhelming, and they are so, they make us feel like there's nothing else but that problem. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if that's a good answer, but it's a fun, fun exercise to do with people. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great answer. And, Pat, I'm also wondering for people uh, that don't know about search, could you say a little bit more about the assets and how you use them? Um, well, yeah. I mean, I... I give these. To, I particularly give these to child welfare workers because I'm not working directly with them with people anymore. Well, people, my child welfare people wouldn't like me saying that. Um, <laughs> I use it particularly when I teach them because I think that um, they use it a lot with families. So they'll sit down with a teenager, say, who's in a family and is, you know having behavioral problems or some such problem, and they'll sit with teenagers and go through this list of assets. And a lot of times, especially people who are going through difficult times, really don't believe that they have as much going for them as they do. And the Search Institute now, if you go to their website, has divided their developmental assets. I, I know, Cordelia, you and Joan have to have been using this for years. Um, but now they've divided it into age groups. So there's developmental assets for 8 to 12-year-olds, right, or for uh, 6 to 8-year-olds or 5 to 9-year-olds. I can't remember the exact number. But So you can use it with all different age kids and talking about what they have uh, as assets. And then, of course, the original was, was working a lot with adults as well. Thank you for that. You had... You had said that you wanted to say more about the Kaufman study, and you have a bit of time to do that. Uh, and 
people are hungry for more information <laughs> too. So, well, well, the Kaufman study was really an interesting one because what happened was Dr. Kaufman wanted to take um, wanted to take children who uh, she tested them for their for their um, uh, 5-HTT gene, and she wanted to take to see what might happen. Um, if uh, I'm just trying to think of how I can tell you this in a nutshell, so she took she took children um, from um, different backgrounds. She took 196 kids, for example, who had been removed from their uh, 196 kids altogether, and 109 of those kids had been removed from their homes by CPS. And she compared them to a, a second non-abuse group of kids who had the same demographics. So you know what I mean by the same demographics, right? And so uh, she questioned them about people in their lives. You know, who do you see regularly? Who is meaningful to you? Who's supportive to you? And then lastly, she, she tested them for, for the 5-HTT gene. And her findings, and I can actually read this from the PowerPoint I have from previous so I get it right, uh, her findings were the abused children with two short versions of that gene had a higher mean score for depression than the abused kids with two longs and the non-abused kids, no matter which version they had. And then further studies, and this is, this is where the environment comes in and where it's so important for those of us who work with, with children and families to, to really focus on the environment. Um, when the environment was considered, the, the differences were amazing. Um, the mean depression score for abused kids with two short versions who rarely saw the adults they named as someone significant to them was off the charts. But abused kids with two shorts who saw the adults they counted on daily or almost daily had depression scores very close to the scores of the children with two longs and within reach of the kids who had never been abused. So, you know, for for some reason, as a group, kids who have short 5-HTT gene versions fared pretty badly when the environment failed them. And those who had uh, two long versions seemed to have this kind of a kind of a shield uh, uh, to uh, to protect them or to help them handle adversity uh, more easily. So anyway, that's just like a boy. Is that an overview? She'd probably have a heart attack if she heard me making it that short. Uh, but it, it was just a fascinating, um, fascinating study. That's that's a great thing. And I wonder, Cordelia, maybe we should, we should move to the takeaway because I know the take, the take one action, um, Pat has another great little exercise for us. Right, oh. that's right. So I was thinking it wasn't quite time yet, but you're absolutely right. We have a great thing coming up for you. So, um, so one of the things that's important for us to talk about is uh, and ask you about is what you're taking away. And Joan, do you think we should just go right into um, uh, Pat's or ask, or do you want to just sit, sit with the takeaway first? No, no, I'm, I'm fine. With, let's jump into the next piece. Let's, that, that'd be great. Okay. So I'm going to just... You have, you have control. I know. I'm trying to make it go and it's not wanting to listen to me. So let's see what I can do. <laughs> there we go. We're in the that discussion. Our pretty slide and we're well past that. It just is not wanting to listen and we're at that... Uh, so um, what we want to ask you to do is, I'm, I'm looking for, I've got Pat's slide was coming up there. Next and I'm trying to make it, there it is. We're good. Um, so Pat, I would like you to do this. We, we would like you to do this action. <laughs> this relates to one action um, that we want to ask everybody for and give people a little bit more time with this. Okay. And so, also, so, and we also want to ask people in the audience, as you're as you're listening to Pat, to also maybe if you could talk about your action in the same format that Pat's explaining, that'd be great. Yeah, I think we should make everybody do that, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so, so let me just explain why I do this. I do this after a lot of my workshops because I really think that when you do a workshop, you have to make people think a little bit. You have to make them take some responsibility uh, and be a little bit. Uh, accountable for all that you've put into that workshop and what did they get out of it, you know, besides saying, well, now it's time to go to lunch. Um, so I always give them this because I think it's really a wonderful way to kind of sum up uh, where we are. So uh, sometimes when I'm, I'm doing a workshop and, um, well, I'm not even going to say that. Let's just say after today's workshop, can you think of something that you're going to stop doing as a result of learning a little bit 
about resilience today. So what do you think you're going to stop doing? You're not going to do this anymore. And then what are you going to begin thinking about? Maybe I might try this. Maybe I might do this. Uh, Maybe I might think this way. Um, What are you going to begin thinking about? A kind of planning. And then the last one, the green light, what are you going to do? What are you going to do after today? Um, Wednesday, March 4th, um, at my time, 319 Eastern time, um, what are you going to do? Um, and, and, and I just want to also add, folks, that uh, one of our favorite uh, uh Mantras, I guess, is a good word for it that we use all the time in my work is small but significant changes. So it doesn't mean you're going to do something earth shattering. Maybe it just means you're going to rethink um, how you're doing your work and then you're going to do this, this, and this. Um, Just little things, little things. You never change the world in big giant steps. You change it in these tiny little things. So what are you going to do? So anyway, uh, uh, Joan and I wonder, Pat. I was wondering, Pat, if what we could do is just pause and let everybody do the first one. At least get people who are who can type that down. So, what are you going to stop doing? Let's just see what what kinds of things uh, people say. Um, so excited. So as a result, and, and I would say as a result of I just, that, I just want to jump in and just say, like you know, Pat, I've loved you. Know, I've heard you speak before, and what I love about this question about what are you going to stop doing. But also, you know, thinking about what are you going to do? That I realize, like, I always start my presentations pretty much in terms of acknowledging the trauma of sexual abuse, and I always end on hope. And I feel like there's no reason to do that. I can I can start with hope and end with hope. And you know, so I mean, it's a really simple shift, as you said. There's small things, but that actually I think will be huge. Um, and you know, and so I just really appreciate so the perspective. And I guess what I'm saying, like that would be like one of my stop doing is always starting with the devastation, but starting with the hope, and certainly addressing all the same pieces, but do it in that in that envelope of resiliency. So that's at least for me what I'm going to do. So I guess I would say other folks have other ideas about what are you going to maybe stop doing, or um, and if you're more comfortable jumping to the other questions, great. But I would love to hear from others in the audience too. Um, and some are coming in in terms of someone else starting with hope. Also, uh, Jasmine talking, allowing you know, victims to feel sorry for themselves. So, um, you know, and starting with sort of the hope and ending with hope is sort of a great idea. Thank you um, for acknowledging that, Janice. Um, also, going to stop um, procrastinating and trying to figure out um, how best to spend some time help, um, helping to promote your know, prevention of child sexual abuse. So, really beginning to integrate that from day one um, and using the word the word victim when it's not necessarily um, for legal purposes. So there's some great things in terms of starting that um, beginning the intention intention, um, intentionally to empower survivors so they don't have to be defined by what they've experienced um, and really let them know they believe in them. So these are all wonderful comments. Um, And and again, another fantastic exercise, Pat, in terms of stopping, what are you going to stop, what are you going to think about, and what are you going to do? And people might keep going there, but for those of you that are ready, if you can do the what are you going to begin thinking about as a result of today. And I think maybe just since we're waiting for a few other people to maybe jump in, what you're going to do. Um, I think you, given that um, I have um, Cordelia going to be joining me for a conference here in Massachusetts, um, but working with um, children and um, adolescents, well, adults, you know, um, who, with sexual behavior problems. I think one of the things I'm you know, the field of sex offender treatment does talk about the good lives model, but they really not don't actually talk about resiliency. So I want to actually bring that those questions to that conference as well, like this coming week. So that's that's my what am I going to do? So people are talking about starting thinking about how to uh, better empower the survivors, begin thinking about how to bring awareness to of prevention, begin thinking about incorporating resiliency into presentations. Uh, um, bringing this into the DV context and mindset, 
So a lot more on that, but with our time we have, we also want to ask you to, uh, and this is really an action step. As a result of today, I think a lot of you are already getting into those. If there's other ideas you have about how you're going to go and use this material, um, please feel free to add that. And, and while you're typing in there, we want to remind you that this session is taped. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling like um, many of you have said, and certainly like I'm feeling, that inspired, that excited, that like a joy, a gift around this. And uh, one of the actions you can do besides sharing the handouts and the activities and the resources uh, um, is, is know that soon because um, Prevent Con uh, Connect is very efficient about this, the link, you'll be getting the link for the recorded session, and it's something you can ensure, uh, encourage your colleagues to listen to. Um, I love Christopher's comment. I don't know if you guys happen to see it. I'm going to stop taking away only bad parts of the victim story. Um, ah. What a great answer, Christopher, because there's so much more to that story, you know? That's great. You guys are wonderful. I'm really impressed. You're wonderful. You're well, doing amazing I, work. Well, and I, and I, and also love, I also love Keith's comment, she's going to badger her coworkers until they finally watch this webinar. So I just hope you read, <laughs> you read that one too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, and I'm curious. We we had a question earlier, and we went we went from there to to this take an action. And in many ways, you've said this already, but we do want to ask you what you're taking away, because it might not be an action. It might be a feeling. It might be a resource. It might be uh, who knows what. So if some of you um, just also think about what. Uh, what your takeaway is for you. And we usually ask, in order to give you a little bit of time to think about that, what's your takeaway from this conversation and from this presentation, we usually ask the presenters, um, presenters about each other, but we went solo with Pat because, um, because we knew what she had to say and, and the amount of information. And I want to just ask Joan, what are you taking away from today? from listening to Pat and from the conversation um, while well, people are typing that in. Yeah, I mean, I certainly, certainly think in terms of my learning, I think the, I really did not know about the science behind this. I sort of had heard, sort of knew about resilience, but not about the alleles. So um, it's just helpful to sort of see that. And, I'm, and I'm, I guess for me, as I pull this back into sort of my work around perpetration prevention, just sort of begin to ask some of those questions as well among the researchers that I work with. Um, so that's fascinating, but the whole piece around keeping the resilience of the envelope first and foremost is probably the biggest takeaway I have in terms of how I'm going to change, change my work and do it differently. And how about, how about you, Cordelia? I am going to immediately go into presentations, some of which are coming up with you. <laughs> And uh, immediately uh, start to to change, and in some ways, it's like reclaiming some pieces that I feel like I let go of, and kind of take a look at it, deeper look at uh, what that is, and the inspiration and the possibility of bringing that back in. And people are, you know, one of the first ones was that new definition of resiliency, and yay, the power pet you asked us to all be using that, and that is definitely one of those actions that we can take, um, and. The, the people are taking away the hope and they're taking away more curiosity about the research and having the details, even in what you feel like was a, such a short time and was, Pat, given what you have to offer, it was a gem in terms of giving people just really concrete pieces of information that they can immediately use and apply. And um, um, somebody else was saying, Carlene was saying, going to uh, uh, the value, the strength in everyone I have contact with on a daily basis to develop resiliency in everyone I have contact with. So people feeling very motivated to do that and apply this in the lives of people who have been affected by trauma regularly. Um, so both in our work in our, and with our colleagues and in our communities, people are thinking about and talking about things that they can do and happy to reinforce to survivors that there's science regarding resilience that can give them hope and confidence also just came in. So I... Uh, 
if I if I could just add one other thing in addition to family and in addition to community and the people we work with is is our own children. I don't know how many people mm. out there are parents, but we sometimes forget some of the biggest contributions we can make is to teach our children, our own children, uh, and we haven't mentioned that. And I think that's a really important right. piece. Right. Great Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for that. So no, we're at the point, excuse me, where we're going to, um, this just does not want me to move. There. You have contact information for Pat. So get information on her website. You know how to contact her. And uh, you know that the handouts and the uh, PowerPoint are at the Prevent Connect um, site. So we want to just give, I wish we could, you could hear a round of applause, a hug. Spirit love from all of us here uh, for all the hard work you did to put this together, Pat, and I'm sh and many many thank yous that have been coming throughout this session to you from participants. We want to thank the participants for prioritizing taking this time to attend today. As always, thank Joan and everyone at Prevent Connect um, for uh, being able to do this and being able to offer this. And finally. Um, the information on how you can get to this information is here. So thank you. And I'm sure, Joan, you want to add to that? I just want to add my heartfelt thanks to you, Pat, for doing this. I think I just want you to know that both Cordelia and I fought over who got to introduce you. So I want to get this final <laughs> thank you. And also just thank you to um, you know, Imelda for coming back and joining us today, for Ashley um, and for to Prevent Connect for hosting these. So thanks, everybody. and. Um, I guess go out and, be, and, and talk resilience. Take care. <laughs> Thank Bye. You. Thank you all so much. This will end uh, our session for today. Have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Thank you for listening to this Prevent Connect podcast. Prevent Connect is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views presented on Prevent Connect are not necessarily the views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. To learn more about Prevent Connect, visit www.preventconnect.org. For more information about CalCASA's mission or to show your support, visit calcasa.org. That's C-A-L-C-A-S-A dot O-R-G.